So we're going to go ahead and dig in now in John chapter 13. And, and uh, you know, the, the question really that, that I was driven to in, in going over this is, is what, what does love look like? Love itself, because, you know, you, you can love pizza, like me, you can love football, right? You can, you, you can love taking a nap. See, I, at some point in my life, that turned from a punishment to a reward, okay? I don't know, but, you, you know, we, we love those things, but then there's the love between a man and a woman. There's the love between parents and children, uh, siblings, good friends. Uh, love is, it, it's such a tiny word, right, to, to try and cover so much ground, so, such a big topic with. I can't define it, but I know this. I know that I often fail in the way that I love other people. I know that's true for me. I, I can hold on to wounds, you know, things that I've forgiven, and suddenly it rises up, right? I can, I can entertain negative thoughts about people who've hurt me. I can, uh, you know, I can walk away from a conversation with someone and, and after the fact be struck by the idea that I never spoke to them about Jesus. I never invited them to church. I never talked to them about anything that matters. I mean, if I loved them... I, I would have talked to them. And, you, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, it, that's not love. And sometimes I can be so preoccupied with loving me, I don't even see you. And I hate that about me. I really do. And, and I, want, I, I want to love more consistently. I want to love more genuinely. I want to love more passionately. That's, that's what I want. And more than any other thing, this chapter 13 in, in John is really about love. So we're going to start right now in verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival, uh, and Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He loved them to the end, to the end, literally. He loved them to the end. You know, a lot of people don't love to the end. L love is an action. It's a decision of the heart. And a lot of people only love when loving is easy, you know, and, and when, the, when, when it gets tough or when they're just not feeling it, they walk away, right? And, and that we can all be guilty of that at times. And by God's definition, I mean, that's not love at all, right? That, that's so different from the love that Jesus modeled. Jesus loved us to the end. You think even of the end of his life. Hanging on the cross, he granted salvation to a criminal and prayed for those who were murdering him. Father, forgive them. You see, he loved to the end, and that's what he's called us to. Verse 2, the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Has the devil ever prompted you to do something that you knew was wrong? You ever been prompted? Boy, I have. I have. You, you know, and, and as we, you know, we can look around us in the world, we, we can look at our own hearts, right? Every evil in the world is prompted by Satan himself. He's a liar and the father of lies. He's a thief. He comes to steal and kill and destroy. Every evil is prompted by Satan himself. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. See, Jesus, Jesus knew that he came from heaven. And Jesus knew he was the most powerful man in the room. And he knew, just like a company owner walking through the company and knowing he has authority over every employee, just like a company commander walks past his troops and knows he has authority over all of them, Jesus knew that he had the authority. So he knew where he came from. He knew he had the power. He knew he had the authority. So he got up and he began to wash their feet. See, there's something here for us. I mean, do, do you have authority, any authority in your life? Do you have authority in your home? Do you have authority over children? Do you have authority over younger siblings? Do you have authority in your workplace? Because there's something here for us, right? Because he's showing us this is the purpose of authority. The purpose. Authority is not given so that you can be a VIP, so that you can strut around, so that you can be the one who barks commands. Authority is given so that you can serve. 
This is why it's given. Verse 6. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Now, <laughs> you know, Peter, commercial fisherman turned follower of Jesus, right? We know him for his passion. We know him for his faith. All right, now, he alone, of all the disciples, when he saw it, they were in a boat out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Jesus walking across the water, he alone said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you. It was only Peter who had the faith to step out of the boat and start walking. We can be critical because he took his eyes off Jesus for a minute and started to sink. But you know what? His faith was still growing. But he had the faith to step out of the boat. It was Peter. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? Then he said to Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. See, that, that's, that's Peter here. Peter, man, he, he had passion. He, he had faith. He was an all or nothing kind of guy. I love that about him. He, he didn't have time to play games. He was a great example for us of passion for the Lord. He had a strong personality, definitely type A, used to making decisions. He gave himself to Jesus' heart and soul, but he wasn't about to have the Son of God washing his filthy feet. Jesus answered, verse 8, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Oh, well, that changes everything, right? <laughs> this is Peter. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, my hands and my head as well. He says, again, I'm all in, I'm all in. All or nothing, you know, Peter, 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 right? Do you, do you see how quickly he changes? Passionate people are like that. Passionate people have high highs and low lows closely spaced, right? <laughs> I think they're fun to be around, right? I, I like being around people like that. You know, sometimes, you, you know, I'm just chuckling when they're, you, you, they're, they're racing between the two, you know? And, and, uh, but but that's, how, that's how Peter was. And, and you know, the, the Lord... He goes, you know, in a moment, Lord, you can't wash my feet to wash every part of me. And it's easy to stand at a distance and point out people's faults. But I want to tell you something. Jesus loves that kind of passion. And he would rather that you be wrong in your passionate love for him than that you would be right in your apathy. Because Peter was hot. He was hot in his faith for Jesus, and Jesus could correct him because, man, he was cooking. He was all in, and he could, he could be corrected. But those people that are lukewarm, Jesus just wants to spit them out of his mouth. You know, where are you? He's looking for that kind of passion. You know, you know Peter, when, when we trace our spiritual lineage... In other words, you got saved because, you know, your mom or your dad, grandma led you to Jesus. Maybe it was through the preaching of the word. Maybe somebody wrote a book and you read it. And that person got saved because somebody shared with them who got saved because somebody shared with them. And people in this room, you're going to trace your salvation right back to Peter. Many people, I believe, even in this room. Well, why could God use him? Because he was all in. Right? Yeah, he made some mistakes. He was still growing. Yeah, sometimes he got confused about who was in charge, him or Jesus, about who was protecting who. But man, he was in, he was in, he was in. And the Lord, can, he, he can correct, he can direct a guy like that. He, he can help him, right? And, and we do, and Jesus did. He helped him again and again to see what was what. But man, I just love that passion. So he said, you know, okay, then wash all of me, Jesus. Well, Jesus answered, verse 10. Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. At this point, he's talking to everybody, and he says, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. See, we are spiritual people. And Jesus' practical teaching always had spiritual implications. Otherwise, it would have no value for us. You see, this, this body, this is not me. This is the tent where I live. I mean, I live in here, 
me, but, but this is not me. This is just where I live. Because we are spiritual beings. And so there was a spiritual uh, application to what he was saying here. See, he, he had turned this conversation to that whole group and said, you are clean, though not every one of you. Because he knew that Judas was a betrayer, a pretender. He, he was one of those kind of people who go to church and say all the right things, but, but ultimately they're more concerned with money and possessions or hunting or fishing or friends and social media status and clothing than, than, than they ever were concerned about their own souls, right? Pretenders. The others were clean. Judas was not clean. When Jesus said they're clean, he, he was talking about their faith. Right? He was talking about 11 men who had been saved by faith, 11 out of 12, who had been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, even though he'd not yet gone to the cross. All right? The, the scripture says that he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Right? He, he just waited. They're covered by the blood of Jesus because of their faith. Because of their faith, they were clean. So that's the question Are you clean? Because I believe with all my heart that if Jesus was standing right here on this stage, that he would say the same thing, looking out over us. If I was sitting there in the front row, he would look out of this and he would say to us as a group, you are clean, though not all of you. Not all of you. I'd be stunned if in a crowd this size there weren't some of those pretenders. Somebody who's, you know, they're, they just, you know, the same old me with a little bit of Jesus wrapped on. No new heart, no no way of thinking, same filthy language, same bad habits. Just now I'm adding a little Jesus in. No, that's not what it means. That's not what it means to be saved, to be regenerated, to be born again. He said, I've set you an example now that you should do as I've done for you. When Jesus said, you're clean, he didn't say to them, have you prayed a prayer asking Jesus into your heart. He's not, if I said, are you clean? I'm not asking, have you been baptized? I'm not asking, do you attend church, right? Ultimately, this is a question about whether or not you belong to him. Are you all in? Are, are, not are you perfect, but are you all in? If you've been washed clean by the blood of Jesus, okay, then he would say you're clean. And yet, he's still clean in their feet. Well, you know what? If you're born again, if you're saved, you discover very quickly that you can still walk into the muck of sin real easily, can't you? He says, well, you know what? You're going to have to have your feet clean. You're clean. You're still going to have to have your feet washed. Well, how, how often? Well, praise Jesus. He doesn't give us a limit, right? He'll forgive us again and again and again if we come to him. All right, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We just come. See, now Jesus, he was teaching about serving each other. That's true. But his greatest act of service was on the cross, and it was, it was tied to the cost. It was the cost of our forgiveness. And it's often true for you and me that our greatest act of service to another person is to be willing to forgive them. It's to be willing. That that's the greatest act of humility, the greatest act of love. It's to forgive that person who's hurt you most deeply. Verse 16, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, notice the difference here between knowing what is true and doing what is right. See, knowing what is true leads to understanding. Doing what is right leads to God's blessing. It's entirely possible to know what is true, to believe that it's true, and to not do it, isn't it? We can be there. He, Jesus said, if here, he said, now that you know, that leads to, now that you understand, knowing leads to understanding, now that you know, you will be blessed if you do these things, right? And so now we come to this place after three years of ministry where Jesus reveals the betrayer. 
In fact, he points in this conversation to Psalm 41.9, and I want to show this to you because this was written a thousand years before this moment. By This is a psalm of, of King David when he was a shepherd, you know, he, either, either before or after he was made king. He was a, Israel's great songwriter in history, and he wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 41.9. David wrote a thousand years before this moment, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And now look at what Jesus said in verse 18. He says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus says that written a thousand years ago, that psalm that you guys know, okay, the, the, the songs that you sing. He said, that's about me. It's being fulfilled here now in this very moment. And he says in verse 19, I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts the, me accepts the one who sent me. So if they accept you when I sent you, that's the same as accepting me. And if they accept me, it's the same as accepting the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Now you, you think about that for a moment. You know, I've spent five days in moose camp and learned stuff about guys I didn't even want to know. <laughs> you know, boy, I can't, I can't ever get rid of that one, you know. These guys, for three years, they were together. They were marching together through the heat and, and fixing each other's blisters, for all we know. They were sharing meals, sleeping out on the ground, enduring at times not only hardship but persecution together. They knew each other, and yet they didn't have a clue, not one of them, who it was that was the betrayer. He says, one of you is going to betray me. They didn't even have an inkling. They're just looking around the table. Who, who? Who could it be? See, people can fool you, can't they? I, I've been fooled by people I thought were my friends. That ever happened to you? I've been fooled by people I thought were Christians. Three years with Judas, the guy in charge of the money, not one of the 11 others ever suspected him of being a false brother in the Lord. People can fool you. They, they can fool you. They can hurt you. They can talk bad about you. They can deceive you. They can pretend and then turn. What are we to do in the face of that? You know what we're to do? We're to love them anyway. Love them anyway. Yes, it's true. People can fool you. So love them anyway. Yeah, it's true that they can deceive you. Love them anyway. You, you know, you're never going to stand before the Lord and hear him say to you, you know, you shouldn't have loved that person. That's not going to happen. Love them anyway. Let, let the Lord sort that out, right? We just want to We just want to. Jesus knew who would betray him. Judas was chosen because Jesus knew his heart. He, he knew Judas loved money uh, more than he would ever love God. He knew Judas was a thief. He knew he stole money from the money bags that was given to provide food for them as they traveled and provide for their needs. He knew that. And to fulfill God's plan to redeem the world, he had to choose a man who was so callous that he would sell Jesus out for money. Jesus, the miracle worker. Judas saw all those miracles. Jesus, the teacher, like, like no other. He was there. He heard the teaching. As the betrayer went out, verse 31, when he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. So, so as the betrayer goes out, Jesus experiences this air of finality. 
His, his purpose for coming to earth is drawing to, to a close. It would soon be fulfilled. And we see right here this brief glimpse of his Godhood shining through as he's talking. This is a 33-year-old man, Jesus, talking to grown men. And what does he say? My children. I mean, who says that? What, 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 what 33-year-old man is going to stand in a group of men and say, my children, who would do that? You know who would do that? God would do that. God would do that. The Savior of the world would do that. He would say, my children. My children, you'll... I'll be with you just a little longer. He's prepping them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be gone because they've been with him all the time. And he says, you're going to look for me. But as I told the Jews, I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. Listen, they went with him everywhere. If he was going, Lord, we're coming. Lord, we're going to be there. They walked away from everything. And he says, listen, I'm getting you ready for this. You're going to look for me. Listen, where I'm going, you cannot come. My children... And then he said this, a new command I give you, love one another. Now, a lot of people look at this and say, wait a minute, that's not a new command, because we can go back when God was giving the law to Moses, and he told them they were to love each other, and, and that's true, all right? In part, that's true. But Jesus wasn't finished right here. You see, in the Old Testament law, they were commanded to love each other, but, but there, were all, there was also a command about justice, all right, being applied in, in, in a human standpoint, you know, between people. And essentially, when they took those two commands that kind of seemed to be at odds with each other, they interpreted that in such a way that it was kind of like love the people who love you back or love, you, you know, the people who, 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 who don't harm you, love the people who are good to you. That was kind of the way in application that it worked out for them. And so when he's saying, and in fact, in Leviticus chapter 24, 19 and 20, okay, the law says anyone who injures his neighbor is to be injured in the same manner, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. So you see, they had this, this dual lens of, of, of what does it mean to love someone else, right? And so now Jesus, again, he's teaching them a new way of living. He's teaching them a new way of thinking. And, and he's teaching them a new way of acting toward one another. And so the, the whole verse there, verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you so you must love one another. See, he raised the bar. He set a whole new standard. Is there any sin that Jesus is unwilling to forgive? No. So there can't be any sin that I'm unwilling to forgive. Is there any person that Jesus is unwilling to serve? No. So there can't be any person that I'm unwilling to serve. You see, it's, it's a new bar, right? It, Jesus demonstrated a sacrificial, limitless love, and he said, this is how you're to love one another, right? As I have loved you, this is how you love one another. Lord Jesus, help me, right? Boy, help me love the one who lies about me. Maybe that's your hang up. Help me to love the one who misunderstands me, the one who slanders me. Help me to love the one who takes and takes and takes and never ever, uh, uh, you, you know, gives. Help me to love the one who wounded me and never ever ever said that he or she was sorry. You know, what, what's the hard one for you, right? Help me to love the one who abandoned me, who walked away. Help me to love the one who hates me and opposes me, the one who mocks me. Uh, you know, help me to love those people who are hell-bent on destroying this country. Maybe that's yours. Help me to love those who are destroying the innocence of our children. Maybe that's it. Help me to love them, right? But here's the thing. When I, if I'm going to love these people, then I can't, I can't fight with them over their sin. I got to ask God to break me over it. I got to say, Lord, help me to weep over their sin. Because at one time, God looks down. He sees them when they were three and four years old. And every one of them was a beautiful little child and innocent to all the evils in the world. And this is where they've come to. And Lord Jesus, help them. Amen. Right? We want them to be saved. We have to weep over that sin. Yes, we stand for what is right, but we stand with gentleness and humility. 
Say, Lord Jesus, help me to love them that way, right? This is a new way of living, a new way of loving. Help me, Jesus, to love the world the way you loved the world. You so loved the world, you gave your life for others. Help me to so love the people around me that I'd be willing to give my life just to see them in heaven. See, that's the command. That's the new command. It's to love with the love that's, that's so radical, it's so countercultural, it's so contrary to our human nature, to our sinful nature, that the lost people surrounding us are going to sit up and take notice. What, what is it about these people? Man, they are so kind. You know, they're so loving, even when people are really being bad to them. You know, what, what, what is it, Right? That kind of love is a signature of pure Christian faith. That's the kind of love that builds orphanages and hospitals in third world countries and, and drills water wells you know, to give clean water to the poorest of the poor. And it's the, that's the love that rushes in when there are earthquakes and floods and natural disasters with people spending their own money and buying their own tickets and traveling on their own time so that they can just help in the name of Jesus and always in the name of Jesus sharing the good news, the gospel in the name of Jesus, inviting people, okay, to come to Christ, to come to faith in Jesus. Everything, everything done in his name. In verse 35, Jesus said, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. I know that that kind of love, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it in operation here in this church family. I've experienced it personally, that kind of love. People willing to forgive an offense. People willing, uh, you, you know, to, to, to put things that, that, that I've said or done and, and, and just literally lay them at the feet of the cross and love me anyway. And this is, this is the signature. Th this is the identifier of those who are walking rightly with the Lord, that we have that love here for one another. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I remember a time in my young adult life when I thought saying, well, I believe in God was like a moral equivalency, like that was a golden ticket to heaven. Like that put me on the same plane as any person who said they were a Christian. People, it isn't true. I didn't know the Bible says you say that you believe in God, good for you, the demons believe and they tremble. I didn't know that it was Jesus who said, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. If you believe that Jesus told the truth, you come by faith asking him to forgive you and to save you, asking him to be the Lord of your life, literally laying your life down, dying to self and surrendering your life and asking him to be your Lord and your Savior. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, the scripture says you will be saved. There may be some in here who believe that this is true. Maybe today for the first time you believe that this is true. And, you're, and, and maybe I remember that wow moment for me. And I was 25 years old and I went, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is true. This is true. And I needed to respond to that truth. The Lord was pulling at my heart and maybe he's pulling at yours right now. If you believe that this is true and you know that you're not a child of God, you've never asked him to forgive you and save you then we want to give you that opportunity right now. We'll all bow our heads and pray with you. Just bow and pray this simple prayer of faith right where you're seated. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died on a cross to pay for my sins and the sins of the whole world, and I believe you rose again. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I've said and thought and done so many things that are wrong. I know that I'm guilty. I know that apart from you, I have no hope. And I'm asking you, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm asking you to save me. I'm asking you to adopt me to be a child of God. Here and now, 
I am surrendering my life to you. I'm inviting you to be my Lord and my Savior by faith. And here and now, because you promised, I'm receiving the gift of forgiveness and new life. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. My life belongs to you.